Ну, добрый вечер. Рада вас видеть сегодня. Um, если вы не знаете, то я вам скажу. Сегодня доклад будет у нас на английском. Да, сегодня мы поговорим о том, каким образом выстраивать долгосрочные отношения с клиентом, что вообще такое финансовая практика, какое сейчас положение в мире у нее. Также мы поговорим о том, какие, почему так много проектов в финансовой практике у нас не совсем удачные. И об этом все нам расскажет наш сегодняшний спикер. I want to introduce our speakers, Cliff Moss, head of financial practice in data art. Cliff, let's start pitch. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, I was just told a few minutes ago that this is the first IT talk in English in the uh, Dnipro office. Um, unfortunately, I'm Scottish. So, <laughs> so, so if any of you are struggling to understand me, it's not your fault, it's my accent. Okay. So um, I should have a subtitle here. I took it off because I don't like too many words on slides. Uh, the subtitle would be, why does it matter? Okay. <coughs> and the reason I feel qualified to talk about why does it matter, while you know, everyone talks about the fact that they do IT outsourcing services, but I come from the other side of the fence for a very long time. So I have been commissioning IT outsource companies for about 25 years. So my background, um, I am very old, my background was that I was a chemical engineer uh, in the 1980s and then I became an industrial engineer. And when I was an industrial engineer, This was the time when PCs started to become available. And you know, there was mainframe computing before that, but mainframe computing in those days genuinely was used just for storage. And it ran the payroll, and it didn't do anything interesting or particularly useful. <coughs> and when I saw uh, PCs, I, I got really inspired about what they could do. So f I worked in manufacturing and engineering, and I looked at our um, production management. If anyone's worked in those industries, we looked at uh, you know, production management um, It's quite complex, uh, a lot of logistics, etc., involved. And we would have walls like that covered in pieces of paper and bits of string, trying to track everything going through the whole supply chain. And I looked at PCs and I looked at spreadsheets. I think we had something called multi-calc or visi-calc in those days or super-calc or something. And I thought, well, you can do it all on that. Uh, so then I got really interested in IT. And I always got called the IT guy. And I said, well, I've never really been a developer, so I'm not a real IT guy. I'm just an enthusiast for what it can do. So my background then <coughs> was that by accident, really, I ended up in financial services and capital markets, uh, which some people say is a quite a boring industry. Um, but it, it, there was one aspect of, of the industry that really appealed to me, which is there's a lot of complexity because I get bored very easily and I need to be challenged. I need to be forced to learn stuff. I need to solve hard problems. And actually, if you work in capital markets, trading, hedge funds, exchanges, etc. It can be very complex. So that kind of satis satisfied me. Um, but when I, uh, so then I moved into financial services. I was running major transformation programs. So uh, you pr this probably might not mean anything to you, but uh, things like the rescue of Lloyds of London, the big insurance marketplace uh, in London was in deep financial trouble. And, and, the, and the solution was to build a new insurance company and reinsure the old market to the new market, etc. And so I designed all the business processes, all the IT systems, uh, the organizational structure then, then led the, the, the building of all that. And <coughs> at that point, uh, I started to get interested in using outsource IT services. Subsequently, having done that program successfully for three years, I then went to automate the trading at LIFE, the London International Financial Futures and Options Exchange. Uh, and then on, uh, my career was then I became a chief officer, chief operating officer in private equity, market to data and exchange technology. Um, but way back, I got introduced to uh, IT consultancies, management consultancies. I hired McKinsey, I hired Accenture. I also hired Indian outsource firms. I hired onshore um, outsource firms. And they gave me a lot of advantages in terms of scalability, also access to um, real skills, uh, deep skills. And I've always had this slight suspicion that if you have in-house teams, um, <coughs> I don't know, in-house teams, uh, I feel, don't often grow their IT knowledge very well, um, whereas IT professionals working for firms like Data Art, and, and there are many other firms like Data Art, uh, they tend to actually uh, become more deeply skilled. So I, I became a huge convert. And a few years ago, I hired Data Art, and, um, and then I used to nag them all the time. I used to say, you're much better than you realize. If you did this, this, and this, you could be the next Accenture. And I kept nagging them, saying, you could do more, you could do better. And they said, well, why don't you just join us? So last January, I became the global head of the finance practice. 
Um, so, so, so what this is about is why do we do it? Okay, the fact that we do it is a given. It's, it's why do we do it? What do people actually buy? What do they look for? What are they actually looking for when they come to firms like ours? First few slides are just some facts and numbers. We'll skip through those quite quickly, and then there's more. In hopefully, you'll find it more interesting stuff later. <coughs> now, the other, uh, the I usually give a health warning. Now, I produce the worst slides imaginable. They are just lists of bullet points. But today, I have a special treat for everyone, including me, which is uh, Victoria Lazenko, one of our designers in Lviv, actually took my terrible slides and made them much better. So you'll be s you'll be spared the horror of bullet points bullet points bullet points um and i did one of those yesterday i was so embarrassed i couldn't believe i wrote them <coughs> okay so here's just to give you some facts and numbers remain in anyone's way just say and if you can't hear me there's someone at the back whose job today is to go like this and that means i speak louder so if you think i'm going up and down uh it's her fault um so here we are uh global business spend on it outsourcing so this is for all for all businesses this isn't just for financial services 450 billion dollars is spent on IT outsourcing uh, in the world last year. I think these are underestimates. <coughs> it's very hard to collect the data, but we know for certain 450 billion was spent. Uh, it's probably more. Um, and uh, it broke down, uh, and this is across all industries, um, it broke down infrastructure as a service, management, support, hosting, infrastructure, application development, and other. And um, in case you're interested where data art is, I'm not going to talk about data art all night. I know you've come to, to learn other things as well. But we are in the management 5%. We're in the support 12%. We're not particularly in the hosting. We do it for our clients almost as a favor. Um, ditto infrastructure, we do it as a favor. It's not what we market ourselves for. Application development is 100% us. That's what we are very passionate about. And actually, we're very passionate about other, which might sound a bit strange, but we're an IT consultancy. We, you know, we, so we build systems. Of course, we build systems, but we do a lot more before we build the systems. So um, we, we go in and we understand our clients' business problems. Uh, often, our clients will come to us and say, we need you to build X. And we say, okay, but you know, what are you trying to actually achieve? And then we have a discussion with them about what their business problems are, what their opportunities are, and we try and give them some options and ideas. Um, you know, for me, it's relatively easy because my background is in leading businesses. Um, but you know, the data art people of longer standing than me do very well in that. And then we end up building the right system instead of building systems right, uh, which uh, which data art certainly does. Um, so other takes up a lot of hours as well. Um, so here's the financial services IT spending. So this is all IT spending. It's a very big number. So this includes in-house developments um, and operations and, and outsource. Um, so the, let me have a look, um, $275 billion is being spent by banks on IT, just banks <coughs> in the world, and um, $205 billion being spent on everyone else in financial services and capital markets. It's not a bank, so that's insurance companies and exchanges hedge funds, asset managers, fintech, etc., etc. So $480 billion in total. Now, why am I telling you these numbers? Because actually you only need a small bit of that to be an incredibly successful firm. And because I've worked in banks and the other ones, <coughs> I know that the real challenge in those firms is finding really great, talented IT people. And they will pay anything if they can get super good IT people because we'll talk about the issues in the industry but if you think about banking it is crippled by legacy system issues and they need people to come in and look at the incredibly complex legacy architectures incredible amounts of redundancy and complexity they don't understand their architectures they don't understand their data management issues and they need good for them it doesn't matter whether they pay you you know 500 pounds a day a thousand pounds a day 10,000 pounds a day, to be honest, the amount of money that you will save banks by resolving some of their issues is billions, is billions. Well, a well-known British bank is losing two billion pounds, so two and a half to three billion dollars every 12 weeks. And you know, the, the majority of their spend is on IT, the rest is on ops. Uh, so you know, uh, there's a lot of money out there. Okay, so here's a uh, I have to apologize, uh, the previous slides, I didn't actually credit who gave us those, those numbers. Let me just have a quick look. Um, I think that comes from Deloitte. So this one is A.T. Kearney. Do they, uh, they actually do this survey every year. So if you want to Google this every year, you'll see what's happening. So this, uh, I mean, I'll, just, I'll skip through this quite quickly because I'm just going to point out the correlations. 
here's the main um, locations for outsourcing and they split it between the financial attractiveness of the location and you'll see Ukraine is down here at number 24 uh, India is number one China number two Malaysia number three so they split it between financial attractiveness people skills and availability and the business environment and um, business environment actually Ukraine doesn't score particularly highly but then neither does India which is top and if, if you're good at your correlations I'm sure you're all absolute geniuses at correlations you will spot that the most populous countries in the world are at the top so <laughs> the more people you have the more attractive you are in terms of people <coughs> uh, we can argue about skills okay we all have our view on the skills in some of those locations um, this is being recorded so I have to be a bit careful because I might end up in trouble uh, but there's a place that actually has individuals who are brilliant developers um, but you can't really go to a company and say I'm a bank these are my problems can you fix them that you know just doesn't work if you want to hire one-off brilliant people that's quite a good location you know so um, actually Ukraine you get you get a great mix um, and uh, it's very accessible of course which we'll talk about later United Kingdom doesn't do so good people skills and availability so this this is interesting so I have to confess a, a fact here so the UK scores very well on uh, people skills and availability at the risk of betraying my own country folk the best IT people in the UK come from Eastern Europe okay <laughs> we we're actually not very good at IT our uh, your education system is 10 times better than us and here's a fact from a survey done in 2010 2011 um, by the age of 16 uh, students high school students in former Soviet Union countries will have done five times more computing and three times more maths than the equivalent UK or US student that is an unbelievable difference five times more computing so how you know if you hire a young UK developer um, they have been crippled by our education system I'd like to think we'll fix it one day uh, but who knows uh, so this is a, this is a slightly confusing sl slide, but I can I can explain it. So this was done on a survey as well. Where bank? This is simply the banks were asked, where are you increasing your spend? Where are you decreasing your spend? So what you'll find is that the same things are appearing on either side. So uh, BYOD, um, uh, you know, there you've got 40% of banks surveyed are increasing their spend, but over here you find 10% are decreasing okay so if, if it looks slightly contradictory it's not it's just how people responded um, but desktop servers investment management internally networks brand technology they're decreasing spends desktop shouldn't be a surprise uh, for anyone on this side and we'll talk about trends in the industry security if you're thinking of uh, which skill you're going to add to your portfolio next please add cyber security um, and then blockchain and you will be able to retire soon security spend is going through the roof and it's only going one way machine learning as well because actually I think uh, cyber security I, I write quite a lot of articles on cyber security so I'm a bit passionate about it um, but you know cyber security is going to become AI ML led because it's going to be machine versus machine wars it's going to change in its nature data analytics uh, gets more and more important mobile banking compliance in banking and all aspects of financial services since the crash regulated compliance is a massive issue and you might think it's quite easy you just you know report what you're doing to the regulator unfortunately banks find that very hard to do because of their systems because of the uh, terrible mess of the legacy systems they have so I know a small investment bank I won't name them <coughs> and it is a very small investment bank of a relatively large retail bank uh, I had a meeting with them and they said we have 100 risk systems and I burst out laughing which is very rude of me and I said but that's a hundred times riskier than having one risk system and they said yes we actually have hundreds of people who every day reconcile the outputs of our hundred risk systems and try and figure out the least wrong answer to send to the regulator so if you can you know so they, they and also because regulatory breaches can get you sent to jail if you're a director uh, they don't care what they pay you to solve that problem um, understandably okay moving on can you see okay all right Alexandra my PA <laughs> she's the boss really um, okay why do companies outsource so this is a general question and and we're not in some of these sectors so 59% um, of people surveyed said uh, of company surveyed said cost reduction 
data art is not there at all. Not in the slightest bit interested in saying, we'll do your IT and it'll be cheaper. Well, you know, or we're cheap. Uh, often we do save them enormous amounts of money, but we're not a body shop. We don't go in and say we're cheaper than the people you have right now or cheaper than your permanent staff or any of that sort of stuff because we're not necessarily cheaper. We're not interested in being cheaper. What we're interested in is doing an amazing job for them. So we don't compete there. Um, and there are many other firms that don't compete there either. To enable a focus on the core business, that's slightly changing. So I'll give you a very quick example without rambling on too much. The asset management industry, private equity, um, uh, investment management, for example, for many years they regarded their core expertise, their USP, as being their investment decisions. And then their next expertise was what they did with those investments once they'd bought a controlling interest or the whole company. And so they were outsourcing their IT quite regularly because they just regarded it as keeping Microsoft Office going on the desktop. And they, d they said, well, we, you know, we can give that to someone else, uh, which made sense, except the thinking was wrong because actually asset management firms can do enormous amounts with IT and they're waking up to that. And in part because data art does a lot and we evangelize about it. But, you know, the ability to do analytics on research as to which investment they're going to make, the decision support systems, machine learning, much enhanced reporting, et cetera, et cetera. They're suddenly waking up to the fact that actually IT is very uh, important to them. But they would have said, until recently, they would have said that's why they're outsourcing their IT. You know, it's not our core, we're giving it to someone else. Solving capacity issues, massive issue. It's very, very hard in places like London to actually have all the skills you need, all the people you need, doing all the projects you need. It's just, you just can't recruit them. And there's so much competition for people that they get hired by Goldman. If they're any good, they get hired by Goldman Sachs and paid double. So. Uh, that's a good way of mitigating the problem. Enhancing the service quality. And this is, you know, so where do we get to? Um, enhancing service quality, critical to business needs. So data art, for example, again, not the only one. We are actually going into the projects that are super business critical, that are absolutely 100% mission critical. We have, we, have, we have clients who, you know, the system we're building, if, if, we, if it fails, they're dead. It's as simple as that. Access to intellectual capital, you know, highly educated Eastern European developers, architects, etc. To get access to them is very important. Okay, managing business environments, we do a little bit of that, but it's important to many people. And driving transformation, so we're big on this. Your organization wants to change, we will come and advise you on how to do the change, and by the way, we'll build the systems. Okay, so here's the advantages of Eastern European systems development. Quality of people, passion for technology. Eastern Europeans are very passionate about IT, genuinely interested in it, not just a job. Work ethic, very hard working. Speed of development, things get done quickly. So, I mean, you might not realize where you're particularly strong, because when I heard data art, the people didn't realize how much better they were than our standard developers in the UK. And sometimes for managers, it's hard to understand that, because if you think about it, developers all seem to be doing the same job. They're all looking at a screen, they're all listening to music, and they're all eating. But if you know how to look at code, Actually, the code quality is enormously different, and that's where your money goes because code quali poor code quality actually results in 10 years of massive support bills, difficulty supporting, difficulties extending and enhancing, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, so um, uh, one of the ways that Eastern European developers work much faster than others is because they actually write much less code to, save to solve the same problem. They start from the point of, I will write the minimum amount of code to satisfy the requirements or to pass the uh, pre prescribed tests. And so things go faster. Value for money, very good. Ease of access, you know, um, I wish it, you know, it's uh, for, for us in the UK, it's, you know, we don't have to get visas to come to, to Ukraine, so uh, very, very accessible. The quality of the product is extremely high and the quality of design, I always say this actually about data art, but I'm sure it's true of other Eastern European firms. Uh, the quality of design is exceptional and it's not always intuitive either so it's not like i know what design you're going to come up with i don't and i look at the design sometimes and i think i would never have thought of that uh, and that's that adds a lot of value so here's the uh, industry issues in financial services capital markets which i'm very well aware of so i'll quickly run around them regulatory compliance and reporting data management data are actually and it's got nothing to do with the name <coughs> the name was uh, came about by serendipity Data Art does more data management projects than anything else because Financial Services Capital Markets does more data management projects than anything else. Um, uh, probably the n in the last two years, we've started 
The next most popular are the digitalization projects, taking existing horrible, clunky, online, web-based products and services and making them properly app-based so that they look, perform the same on desktop, tablet, phone, wearable, etc. Um, <coughs> cost, speed and risk of system support is, is a major issue. The CFOs in banks complain that they can't understand why any change to the system takes so long and costs so much money. And you can explain it to them, but it's still a major frustration. They're just better informed, but it still doesn't make them happy. Uh, customer expectations. So the customer expectations. So insurance is a very good example. Insurance um, products and services online are awful. And actually, most insurance companies only have a, uh, a fraction of their products and services online. Uh, but the ones they have are just terrible, clunky. And, it's, and so the, the, the insurance company that comes out with a properly digitalized solution will capture, people will move insurance companies because of it. And, and not just uh, retail customers, but uh, wholesale corporations will move because their expectations of digitalization are set by Alibaba and Tencent and Amazon and eBay and everyone else. And they look at their banking solution and think, Jesus Christ, what is this? Um, so their, their, their view as to what is good is completely different now. Um, also, linked to that, competition. So e-commerce, fintech, etc. They're producing solutions which are amazing compared to the main corporations. And so people are thinking, well, I'd rather do it with them. We have clients, fintech firms, and they, that, that's what, how they get their business. One of our most successful clients is Monex Europe. It's a deliverable FX uh, firm. Um, and their main competition is the banks that the companies are banking with. They will do their FX for them. Well, Monex comes along and says, we will do it on this platform, and we will do it for a fifth of the price. And, and they move. And there's a lot of inertia to move away from your own bank, but they move. Um, skills. Uh, there is a shortage of skills. Um, now, in the 1990s, the very best students at the very best universities in the West went into um, investment banking. Okay. Now, you could argue, if you're a humanist, that actually they should go into medicine and all sorts of other things, but there you go. They were all going into investment banking. None of them go into investment banking now. Right? It's completely tarnished by the crash, unfortunately, so they go elsewhere. Um, and... Uh, now, th now the banks can't attract the skills they need, but they can for firms like Data Art. Project management is a major, major issue. They're very, very big, these organizations. JP Morgan has 307,000 employees, okay? And then it has, it feels like, almost the same number of contractors, part-time people, etc. okay? So the projects they run are huge, and um, they just can't get the right quality of people. There aren't that many good project managers in the world, um, so they come to firms like us. Uh, corporate culture and ability to change uh, is, uh, is, is a big problem in, uh, in banking. What you tend to find is the chief exec knows he has to change and has to change radically, or she. Um, and then the middle, man, the middle layers don't want to change. And uh, they're, they're like dinosaurs. And so um, they come to firms like us to try and help them. Uh, they're actually quite bad at managing outsourced suppliers as well, uh, these organizations. Um, and... Um, they, they, one of the things they need to do, insurance industry is a good example. Pr if anyone's interested in business process management, process automation, using things like machine learning for that, huge demand for that in, in, in the insurance industry because those companies are huge, but they're very labor intensive. They're quite manual. Uh, I regard spreadsheets as manual. And um, you know, there's a big demand to automate their processes. Um, infrastructure management is a big issue. Cloud migration. If you're into cloud migration, I actually think cloud migration will become almost mandatory for financial institutions because what you'll find is the shareholders are demanding it because the fears about security have gone away. Two years ago, I was doing a presentation in New York where everyone was really scared about moving stuff onto public cloud. And I said, you know, the worst marketing mistake in history was calling public cloud public cloud. They should have called it extremely secure cloud. And then you wouldn't be worried. And, um, <coughs> and then I said, you know, let me give you an example. AWS, public cloud, probably been penetrated less than five times in its existence. The average bank is penetrated more than five times a day. The average bank is subject to 300,000 attacks a year. Now, those five penetrations a day are relatively benign. It's just people sniffing around. They will get, you know, really serious stuff 80 times a year. So, you know, maybe five, six, seven times a month. Um, so when I say that, the next year I go back and suddenly nobody's asking any questions about public cloud security. Uh, so when the world wakes up to the fact that it's actually more secure, because firms like Microsoft and um, uh, Amazon, they do this for a living. This is absolutely what they do. Then they'll, they'll start to migrate.
Uh, legacy system risk and overhead I've touched on. Risk management is a huge issue. Poor risk management, uh, un not understanding systemic risk was the reason we had the financial crash. And IT security and data protection is huge. Okay, and only going to get worse and a bigger issue. <sighs> Sorry. T too many words, too many slides, talking too fast. Is it loud enough? Can you hear me at the back? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank God for microphones, eh? <coughs> um, okay, so who do we work for? Banks, exchanges, investment and asset management firms, market data companies, uh, ratings agencies, insurance companies, brokers and inter-dealer brokers, FX firms, trading houses and fintech and, uh, and insure tech. So we cover most of it. We don't try and do everything. Actually, trying to do everything is impossible, and it's quite a bad marketing ploy as well. But in terms of the actual companies and uh, the products and services, we do, we do quite a lot. Um, what I would say, though, is we don't cover everything. Okay, So we know what we're good at, and we're good at solving those critical business problems. In theory, we do front office, middle office, back office. But if you look at our projects, they're probably more towards the front office than anything else. Probably increasingly in the middle office as well. Um, but big infrastructure type projects we don't tend to do. We tend to pick up infrastructure work as part of front end developments. Um, so, so this is an important point, And I see this mistake made uh, by our competitors. And I never criticize our competitors. There's more than enough work for all of us. Um, but they often stand up and go, um, you know, 10 million developers, 200 offices, we've been uh, going for 30 years, this is our mission state, nobody cares, right? I know that because I was a client, not interested in the slightest. The only thing clients care about is can you solve their problems? And what they really want to know is, have you solved it elsewhere? Tell me how you solved it. Okay, that's great, that's exactly what I want, then I'll hire you. Couldn't care less how many offices you've got. You know, Data Art could have 50 offices, 20 offices, 2 offices. You're going to solve their problem, they don't care. Okay, so to solve a problem is the only reason you really get hired. Um, to fix problems, solve problems creatively, make things better than before, and turn problems into opportunities. Which sounds like a cliche, but actually it's true, you can do it. Um, and what do we do for them? So here's the main things we do. We build new products and services. So we do that more than anything else. Um, but we also re-engineer legacy architectures. That is an enormous area of money. If you just want to set up your own company and do one thing, you will become a multimillionaire just doing that, okay. Um, we love doing that because it kind of plays to <coughs> what interests us. One way, I always say to clients, one way of thinking about data art is it's two and a half thousand people doing their hobby. So, we're, uh, it's, but it's true, we come to work to do what we like doing. And we actually do say, do we like working for these sorts of companies, yes or no? Do we like doing these sorts of projects, yes or no? And if it's no, we just don't do it anymore because, you know, life's too short. Um, and modernizing and exam uh, enhancing existing products and services, we do a lot of that. Not as much as building new stuff, but we do re-engineer the existing stuff. We do a lot of providing expert inputs and resources, so we give a lot of advice. Um, it always turns into work, but you know, even if it was just advice and that was it, then we'd do it. And we do do a lot of introducing new, new ways of working, new technologies. So people do ask us about new technologies all the time. And uh, we always have an evangelist and enthusiast. Um, we don't try and jump on fashions, but Data Art has built more blockchain solutions live in the markets than any other firm. And it was by accident. Uh, we just got asked, do you know anything about blockchain? And we said, well, actually, we've got a couple of guys who are really keen on it. And we got some, you know, some of the top names in, in the world hired us to do blockchain projects for us. And, and now we've got four live solutions in the market. and We're building more. Um, and that's just because we're passionate about investigating new technologies. Um, so, and here's another thing for when you're doing presentations to clients. You've got to talk about what they get out of it, not what, how you do it. What do they get? So they get increased sales and profits. They get increased customer satisfaction and retention. They get improved quality, better productivity, better operational performance. They get better reputations and they get better regulatory compliance. That is what they actually care about, okay? You can jabber on about Java until you're blue in the face. They couldn't care less. All they care about, you could go back to using Assembler and they wouldn't care as long as they got those things. And what do, what do they like about us? Um, so they like the fact that we've solved the problem somewhere else. So it's easy to say, yes, we can solve that problem. But actually what they really like is 
Uh, our clients are very good. They allow us to show them case studies with their names on them. They give us references, which is very nice of them. And so we can say, we've done that. We do that all the time. And that really works for them. Um, we are experts in systems development methodologies, tools, and techniques, because we do meet people who ask us to tell them about Agile or, you know, um, do, you know, and, and so sometimes actually, so some of our very big programs, uh, organizations still insist on using waterfall methods because uh, for huge programs, there's a lot of advantages to waterfall um, in terms of budgeting and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we love to talk about methodologies, tools, and the techniques around program management, project management, agile methods. I'm fanatical about uh, iterative uh, product development techniques, lean product development, and I love jabbering on about, you know, why it works. Um, because the thing is, and I'll say this to people, when clients ask us for a fixed price, I say, no, because you don't know your requirements. And they go, well, I do. And I go, no, you don't. Because, and I'll demonstrate it to you, um, you tell me what you want, I will build you a demo, I'll build you a POC. When I show it to you, you'll go, oh, that's good, Cliff. And I've just remembered 20 other things. Now I'm looking at it. Okay, and then I'll build the next version and we'll show it to your clients. And they'll go, that's great. But we've just remembered 20 other things. No human being can sit down and write their requirements. And actually, there's no advantage to doing it. It's much better to iterate. And so we say those things to people. They love all that. And then they, they start using us. Uh, we really are technology enthusiasts. I mean, even though I'm not... <laughs> I should stop saying this, shouldn't I? Maybe just a few days before I die. But I still don't regard myself as a genuine IT guy. And I've never been a developer. I confess I have written code, but only because in the 1980s there was no one else around. So I had to sort of figure it out for myself. And it's probably terrible. Um, but I am, I'm, I am very passionate about technology. right? So I am very passionate about AI and ML. And I write a lot about it. I'm very passionate about blockchain and cloud and BPM and big data. Um, and that rubs off, you know, when we have other people who are equally passionate and better informed than me. And that rubs off on clients. They love that. And we really do care about our client success. So the most important thing for us is that our clients succeed. Because if your clients su succeed, you'll always have money, right? You'll always have money. It doesn't matter what you charge them because they will tell 10 other people how great you are. And that's we, we don't have any salesmen in the, f in the finance practice, no salespeople at all. Um, and I've never done a sales job uh, either, but we sell a lot. We doubled the revenues last year. We, ha we got 30 new clients in one year. Um, and it's because the clients that we've serviced, they could tell how genuine we are. They tell other people. So we get a lot of people knocking the door saying, you don't know me, but Lance Ugler, Chief Executive Market, or someone told, told me to come and speak to you about what we're doing. Uh, and that works. So we really care about our clients. And it's good, it's good commercially to do that. So we sell outcomes, not people. We don't sell people. <coughs> now, I have to say that some of the big body shops, as I'm being recorded, I won't say their names, but you know them. And um, they have very successful businesses, more or less based around the supply of people to fairly large organizations, and then the clients tell them what to do. And we hire their people because they come to us, and, s and they're really good, really good. But the people come to us and say, the things I'm being told to do are the wrong things. And I'm slightly constrained as to what I can say, or the project is ill-conceived, or the project was well-conceived and they cancelled it halfway through. These people are a victim to, to fortune, you know, really, hostage to fortune. And the, what they like about data are is we own the project. So we say to the client, this is what we're going to do. We will run it from start to finish. We own it, et cetera, et cetera. So, and then we will just, you know, obviously we'll tell the clients what we're doing and we'll consult with them and so on. But in the end, we have control. And so the people we hire from the body shops, they like that because they're listened to and they get to influence how the project is done. And that's very important in work, rather than be told to do something stupid and thinking, well, I can't really say anything. <coughs> or you know, if I do, they won't listen to me. Um, the other issues about doing body shopping are you can be treated quite badly. And I've seen that. Um, there's something about, I don't know what it is, but some people do treat um, external resources not very well. Or you can do a great job and never get the credit. Okay, so you come to Data Art, we actually reward people who do an amazing job and do an amazing project. And you know, we really celebrate their success and we really do reward them and make them feel good. Um, um, we, ge we, we generate ideas, so <coughs> there's a certain type of architect, developer, etc., who loves the fact that they can come up with lots of ideas and we encourage them and the clients encourage them. Um, going back to Monix Europe, as an example, that's one client where we've contributed lots of ideas into their new products and services. Client loves it. The people who generated the ideas love the fact that they see their ideas being implemented. 
uh, we do uh, consulting. Uh, we do uh, so. <coughs> here's another thing. We we um, we use solution accelerators. So we are not a product company. We're never going to be a product. Well, I should never say never, should I? But we've got no interest in becoming a product company because you do, you know doing this kind of work has problems. Being a product company has problems. You do both. You just doubled your problems. Um, but we do use solution accelerators, so obviously we've got a lot of IP, we've learned a lot, so we're not starting from scratch, we're not stealing our clients' IP, but you know, we go into it as experts often, and so our clients aren't starting from uh, ground zero. And we do have extensive experience, so data art is 20 years old, and um, let's face it, many of us, me especially, we were working a long time before data art existed, so there's a lot of experience in the firm. Oops. Okay. So um, here's the other thing I said earlier, but we don't do everything. <coughs> um, uh, I'm not sure how long I'm scheduled to talk for, but I, I, I never talk for more than an hour, so my voice can't handle it. Um, I never make a singer for all sorts of reasons, including that. Um, so we don't do everything. We go to clients and say, we really focus on these areas. This is where we're super strong. And they like that. So digitalization, including UI, UX data management, visualization, structured and unstructured data integration, distribution, warehousing, analytics, uh, I'll add uh, federated data models. Um, data visualizations are actually a very good sales tool as well because people are waking up to the fact that data good data visualizations um, facilitate better decision making. Um, and actually most of the data visualizations in the world are pretty poor and they run the risk of um, creating bad decisions. Um, so data management projects, we love them and we've done lots of them. BPM, <coughs> our BPM expert is here, Andre. Uh, things like Pega. <laughs> um, trading and investment, so we do build trading systems. In the West there's a lot less trading. Uh, Volcker rule around uh, proprietary trading, etc. has inhibited a lot of trading. But uh, we don't just do work in uh, the UK and the US. We built an, al an algo trading system in Saudi Arabia last year. Um, and, and actually trading is much wider than just the actual trading system, so we built a very significant new um, exchange system in the US for the best known exchange in the world. I'm sure you can figure out who that is. And <coughs> we, we re-engineer legacy system architectures and we, we are real experts in blockchain and very passionate about it. So we say to clients, this is our focus, and that's much better than saying we'll do anything, please give us money. And so why do uh, people work with us? Um, well, we are a relatively large international company, and we are very international. I think we speak 20 languages. There's 2,500 of us, and we're growing so fast. Um, blue chip clients, you know, so household name clients. Very interesting work. Um, we do a lot of training and educational programs, so um, we do invest a lot in people. We, uh, we have very low turnover. We don't expect people to leave. What we find is the more we train them, the more access to, to coaching, mentoring, and courses they get, the more likely they are to stay. And um, we do do very interesting and challenging projects. Uh, there's quite a lot of business travel. Um, we do run language courses as well. We've got some great English teachers. We do do innovative research and development projects. And there's one other thing that's not on here that I should mention, which is really in data art, you can have any career you want. Okay, so the managing partner, uh, Alexi Miller, he started off as a developer and um, he felt he wasn't very good at that. Um, I'm not sure whether he was or he wasn't. I wasn't around, but you know, I suspect he didn't really like it. Then he was a project manager. He kind of felt the same about that. And then he started doing sales and he realized he loved doing sales. So anyone in data art can do anything they want. They just have to say. Uh, so f what somebody came to me one day and I was a tester and said, uh, how do I become a delivery manager? And I said, you just ask. You know, it's a simple, you've got to be careful what you ask for because I might say yes. And then you'll think, oh God, I, got, I, be I better find out what I'm supposed to do. But that's what data art's like. You can do anything you want. Okay. Um, so I'll just put a couple of case studies. I won't, I won't bang on about them. Um, so here, here is a typical project for us. <coughs> Caller Capital, great friends of ours, uh, very happy for us to use their name, provide us lots of references. We did a very important master data management project for them. Um, the scope was master data storage. Main entities were funds, companies, and deals. So uh, Caller Capital, in case anyone doesn't know, well, you probably none of you know, are, they're a secondary private equity firm. So private equity takes, um, takes shares or takes controlling interest or takes whole interest uh, in companies um, around the world. And secondary private equity actually provides access to funds of those combined assets. 
and they are the world's top secondary private equity firm and it's quite complex as well the way they structure the investments. It allows people to uh, realize the value of their own investments and, and so on and so on. <coughs> um, I'm just having a quick read of my own slide. Well, you can see how you can see how comprehensive it was. It was front office, back office, and also the pitch book as well. It covered um, massive data management is is massive in 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 uh, the asset management world, and so the benefits they achieve from the project, and and you know they're a long term client. We're still doing a lot of stuff for them. Improved data quality. Uh, we eliminated duplications between the front, middle, and back offices. So typically of an asset management firm, data was held everywhere. There was no you know, golden source of data. It was replicated everywhere. And typical of asset management companies, it wasn't consistent. So which version was right? Well, actually, in truth, they were all wrong. Um, and, you know, and how wrong were they is the question. So now they have complete consistency from proper professional automated data management across the whole uh, enterprise. Um, reduced cost of data management. Well, you can imagine the rework and so on that's involved with resolving queries uh, previously. And better vi visibility across the business lines. Much better visibility, actually. And here is the uh, building of the um, new exchange system in America, which went live in December. And I'm going over to uh, New York to do some uh, television interviews with them about it. B business television, I hasten to add. Um, so uh, they had... <coughs> um, a system that was too slow. Uh, it's as simple as that. And um, just can't, could not handle the uh, high frequency order flow. Uh, lacked quite a bit of functionality. Also lacked quite a bit of resilience. There's a lot, of, you know, it's a very he heavily regulated industry. So you have to be able to monitor and control your, your fast moving markets very accurately because you've seen things like the flash crash happen. You know, when does your system automatically switch the market off because something's happening that looks suspicious? Um, uh, it's very, very. Uh, exchange systems are great. I actually designed one. I, you know, I was clearly a lot cleverer uh, 20 years ago than I am now. And um, if you like a lot of complexity, then the designing exchange systems is amazing, and building them is amazing. And um, the, the challenge, if you ever do one, the challenge is you'll forget something. So you might not do anything wrong, but you'll forget something. Uh, so it's actually nailing down the scope of everything that an exchange system has to do, and all the integrations. If you think about it has to integrate with everybody else's systems, has to integrate with the regulator, uh, and uh, it's very, very complex. Okay, so here's a few success stories. I mean, we could have a very, very long list here, but NASDAQ is a great success story of ours. Uh, Collar Capital, you've seen Squawker, BNP Paribas, Harmonic is another asset management company. Monex Europe is the FX firm I told you about. Apex Partners, uh, another uh, great success of ours, another asset management firm. And um, th when I was a client of Data Art, and I was moaning at them all the time, saying, you should be doing more, you should be bigger, um, uh, I said, one day you will start doing outsourcing. You will actually, and this is, Accenture make most of the money now, not from consulting projects, but actually doing whole outsourcing deals. And I said, you will do outsourcing, even though you, you don't really have an interest in it right now, because what's going to happen is you will do a project for a client who is so impressed by you, they say, please take our whole system development department, including our staff. It will happen. And less than six months later, it happened. And that was Apex Partners, um, great client of ours. Credorac, Standard & Poor's, otherwise known as McGraw-Hill Financial. Uh, I used to work for them. Um, huge uh, company, market data company, ratings agency. Uh, Bimatech, uh, REG in the Lloyds Market. GovCoin, GovCoin's amazing, so that's one of our blockchain projects. Uh, there's another one on there. I can't tell you which one it is. It's, a gov is a, it's also a blockchain project. Uh, so GovCoin is a company with a social mission which is um, to use blockchain to facilitate the transfer of value, that's how they refer to it as money, the transfer of value for poorer people or people in distressed circumstances. So they actually open it up to, um, for example, aid agencies going into places like Haiti after the earthquake. Um, it's being used in the UK, a large trial, thousands of users uh, for people on welfare. It's also been trialed in the US for people on welfare. Uh, there's a bit of a social agenda, it's slightly perhaps uh, controlling of, uh, it's trying to help people with how they spend their money. So there are some stereotypes as to how people spend their welfare checks. Quite unfair stereotypes, but you know what they're like. And so what this does is you can only spend your welfare money at the approved grocery stores, etc., etc. Using blockchain, they can track what you're doing. It sounds a bit like Big Brother, but actually it does help the individuals and they quite like it. 
Um, <clears throat> the markets.com, Bondwave, uh, Bondwave, an amazing firm, wealth management firm allowing private individuals to access the bond markets uh, safely. Um, and and safe safety in accessing bond markets is the most important thing. So they're very well advised, but it's a great platform that we built for them. DPC Data, IPM. There's, there's loads of others. There's lots of banks in there. Um, some of the banks, uh, we can't put their logo on because they prefer that their vendors don't stick their lo logo. And y y you can sort of understand it because they, some of them have thousands of vendors. Okay, we're not a vendor, we're a consultancy. But if they were to say yes to us, why couldn't they say no to you know, a hardware firm or something? And you know, they want to control their brand. Uh, so that's our success stories. Phew, I did it. Summary, financial institutions have major issues, right? Okay, I can't stress that enough. They have, because I've been, I've been in them for most of my career, they have major issues with their product services and technology that needs to be resolved. Um, only the best people thinking designs and implementations can be used on this work. And the reason I say that is not because I'm an intellectual snob. I am an intellectual snob, but that's not why I'm saying it. It's because many of them have been trying to fix it themselves with very average people, and they're just making it worse. They're just building new legacy. Okay, so that I, and actually, some of the stuff built in the 70s and 80s is much better than what's getting built now. Much, much better because the standards of engineering were phenomenally high back in those days, and and, and I don't think they realise uh, this problem. They need their stuff fixed by people who are great. Uh, they can't hire enough good people locally, and they don't have the skills to meet demands. Um, and also, the people who cause the problems are not going to be the people who fix them. <coughs> and Ukrainian data are, have the skills, experience and knowledge to save the industry. We do, right? So it's my job to go and evangelize and make it happen. And uh, if any of you are thinking of joining us who haven't joined us yet, then, uh, then you can do that. Thank you. You're kidding. <laughs> Tatiana comes to all of my presentations and asks questions. Uh, so you've mentioned that uh, Data Art was the works with the clients, uh, uh, with the project for the clients that are crucial for them. Yes. Uh, could you please tell more about the risk risks connected with such projects? So yes. if we fail to the client become a bankruptcy, so one, yeah, we've got one. How we've got we've got we yeah, we've got one right now. If we don't do a great job of building their main platform, then then to be honest, I don't see how they can survive. Um, it's as, it's as simple as that. So we we have to do that now. Not all of our projects are that mission critical, and uh, but we are doing absolutely everything we can. And I actually spend quite a lot of time on that, even though I'm you know running the the practice, 700 and something people, and I've got a lot to do. I spend a lot of time with that client because I'm always working with their board to make sure that they're doing building the right products and services that they're validating with their clients and their potential clients in the market that what they're building is what they want because there's, and there's no point building this and then they don't get the uptake that they need to make them viable. <coughs> so it's not just about the quality of the engineering, though that's very important. And recently I've changed their approach to IT uh, as well to uh, move them to time box releases, move them away from waterfall methods, move them away from you know too much estimating, too much time spent on planning and estimating and just got everyone working on building working software. Um, but yeah, that's su that is super critical. Um, you also have this issue of uh, reputation. So some of our clients are some of the best known names in the industry, not on that, uh, not on that list. Th th they actually will be on the list, I hope. So you, you think of you know, the biggest rating agencies, the biggest exchanges where you've seen NASDAQ up there. Those firms, some of those firms really can't stand to have a major project failure. Okay, so it's just splashed all over the financial press. The regulator gets very, very upset. And we have actually had to, have we had one project where the regulator started off as being upset and I had to intervene with the regulator as well to say this is all going to be okay. Um, so yeah, they, they can be very critical. Um, British banks. So, you know, some British banks are, have been technically bankrupt for years and are, are supported by the, um, by the taxpayers, by the government. And, um, you know, we're building systems for them. Well, if we don't build the right systems and the failures continue and they don't really turn themselves around and stop making losses, then, you know, at some point they're doomed. So it's very important stuff we do. Does that answer your question? Thank you for your question, Tatiana. 
I'll pay you later. <laughs> uh, Hi. Uh, thank you. Great, great presentation. Oh, Very interesting. You. I have a question uh, about financial markets, but in slightly from a slightly different angle. In the beginning, you uh, there was a slide where you. Uh, said that the top destination for outsourcing are like India, India China, China and Malaysia. stuff like that. Yep. We, we didn't have that many, all of the uh, countries in no. the top list, but I suspect that many of them are developing countries. Yes. And uh, the appeal uh, of them as a destination for outsourcing comes, well, I would say mainly from their you know cheap labor Correct. and stuff yep. like that. And don't you think that this is, this type of thing kind of plays against uh, the outsourcing thing for, for Ukraine because we want to become a developed country yep. and uh, then we will lose appeal as being a we destination for well it's outsourcing. A, it's, a very, it's a very good question. We don't compete with those firms. Now, I'm not criticizing those firms. S uh, those very big firms in India, especially in Malaysia, um, their USP, their selling point is that they have thousands and tens of thousands of staff and they can resource all the, IT, all the IT in large corporations and they can do it cost effectively, they've got great management processes, that's what they do. And they're, and they're cheap, they're relatively cheap, though India has got so much more expensive and I, and I started off using Indian firms. We don't, c we don't compete for that business, we compete for the business that's keeping the chief executive awake at night. They don't, you know, because we're going in and saying what business problem you're trying to solve? Okay, master data management, that's what you need. Data warehousing, no, don't do that. Don't do data warehousing. In, in a large investment bank, we said, don't do data warehousing. You'll just end up with too many data warehouses. Federated data model, what's that? Never heard of it. Explain it to them, do it that way. Those Indian in firms don't do that kind of work. Um, so f I think Ukraine should be focusing on the highly value adding stuff which is critical, to your point, which is critical. Not the, you know, you're never going to be able to swamp a company with thousands of people. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a different market. Any... <laughs> 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 Any more questions? Thank you for your question, by the way. It's a very good question. Yeah, thank you for your presentation, Mike question is connected with Dmitry's one. Uh, you told that uh, you have new more than 30 clients this year. And yes. is it easy to prove them to go not to India, not to China, but in Ukraine? Uh, because to prove investor and clients to go to uh, not top country of the list, it's rather difficult. What uh, arguments do you use to prove to go to Ukraine? So we don't really... Um, well, you've got to remember that I'm based in London, and so we, you know, so and then and then we have our office in New York. So they're not deal, you know, they're not dealing with a Russian or Ukrainian firm. You know, we've got two offices in Poland, we've got two in um, uh, Russia, and um, I'm going to get this wrong. Have we got seven in Ukraine? Anyone? Seven, seven in Ukraine. One in Buenos Aires. Uh, did I say two in Poland? Um, <coughs> But, you know, they're dealing with us in London. They're dealing uh, with us in New York. And, um, and, 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 and we do say, you know, that where our development centers are and how strong they are. And I do tell them about why Eastern European developers are so strong and all that sort of stuff. Um, but, you know, they're not, it's not like, do I go and speak to an Indian firm? Do I go and speak to a Ukrainian firm? They go and speak to someone who's very well known in the market, like me in New London or Alexi Miller in New York. And it goes from there. So, um, you know, if, if and sometimes people say, who are your competition? So if, if you're interested, the answer is that the competition for us is Accenture, it is Deloitte, it is Ernst & Young. It's not Luxoft, it's not EPAM, it's not Tata. You know, we know where our niche is. It's the high value adding projects. And I, and I, and I, and I don't criticize any of those firms. I, I think, you know, Tata and EPAM have done fantastically well, but we're in a different business zone. We are in the same business as Ernst and Young and Deloitte and so on. And um, look, look, I mean, they're bigger than us, a lot bigger, but we also work very well with them. So we're doing a major, major program in the US for a large company. Ernst and Young are doing a parallel major program. We have to work together to make sure all our, all our uh, issues are balanced and all the rest of it. 
and that's where we are. So you know, we're, we're not going in and bad mouthing the Indians and saying use us, don't use Indians, because actually, <coughs> if if you're talking to both, one of them is definitely wrong. You know, either it should be an Indian firm using, or it should be us. It can't be, w you know, either will be g equally good because we don't do the same things. Any more questions? Hello. Hi. As far as I know, Data Art has uh, a lot of success stories with uh, uh, huge clients, but uh, these huge clients uh, usually they have not just one project in their life, but uh, project after project, many projects, uh, and um, even. Uh, if we have success story with this client, uh, it's not necessary that next time he uh, comes to us uh, with new project. Uh, as far as they know, they often go to other companies and uh, don't continue working with us. Uh, do you uh, have any statistics about uh, returning clients back to us with new projects and uh, if they don't return, what are the reasons uh -huh. why they go to other places what next yeah. time? Uh, although uh, they are glad of our work and so on. Thank uh, you. Well, yes, I, mean I, sh I shouldn't make public too, too many of our uh, statistics as, as we were being recorded. When I first met Data Art, I would regard, I, I described them as transactional. So they were going in and doing great projects and then shaking hands with the client and saying thank you. And um, you know, hoping that maybe they would get hired again one day. And I was a client at that time, and I said, no, 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 you, you, you can't operate like that. You need to do something called account management. If you think about it, if you hire McKinsey, nobody hires McKinsey for a single project, okay? If you hire a law firm, they're your law firm forever. No law firm goes in and does a single project. They are your lawyers, you know, for years. McKinsey become your strategy consultant for years. Data Art now goes in and becomes the IT partner of the clients for years. That's the point. We do multiple projects, multiple programs. Um, I'm struggling to think of any of our clients uh, since I took over. And actually, when I, I was an advisor for Data Art, so I used, to mo I used to encourage them so much to do more when I was a client that uh, they ended up saying, can you be an advisor as well? Um, and we implement these uh, account management methodologies, tools, and techniques, which is all about understanding where this business is trying to go strategically. So we're a strategic IT partner for our clients, and we do multiple projects. Um, and I can't remember in the last two years any of our clients finishing a project and then saying goodbye. So now we stay and do multiple projects. Uh, so NASDAQ and lots of the other people there, it, they're not single project transactions. And it's not the case. We wouldn't say we're not interested in doing a single project. and. But when we meet them for the first time, we, we do say that we become your development partner, your IT consultancy partner. That's what we do. Um, sometimes they go, great, you are, and, and here's three projects to start with. Um, sometimes they just do one, and, this, and, and their view is, well, we'll see how it goes. But you see, during the one, we learn so much about their business, and we give them so many ideas. And also, we're not really pushy. We're not salesy. We're just genuinely giving them ideas. We say oh, we noticed you were building that, we've done one of those, and, um, and here's some information. We're not trying to sell it to you, you know, just here's some ideas. And uh, so even the single project engagements started in the last two years have become long-term partnerships, multiple engagements, like APAC's partners. That started off as a single project. Uh, NASDAQ started off as a single project, and um, I think maybe Collar did as well. Uh, so, so no, so, so no we, don't do it. We, we don't do the, uh, hello, here's the project, and we, and we go. It's not what we're about. And, and to be honest, it wouldn't be sustainable. If you're in professional services and you're only ever going to a client once, you won't last for 20 years. You just won't. It's too hard. Selling is too hard. What you want is just more and more from the same firm. Uh, uh, Monex Europe, I keep mentioning them, Monex Europe. So we are their IT department. We everything, we, all their IT is done by us. I hope that answers your question. Not, in, not interested in doing single project transactions. It's too hard and it's not very cost effective and it would hurt your profits. And it's not good for the client. Uh, thank you much, Cliff, for your presentation. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, thanks. <laughs> uh, I would like to also, um, as an example, uh, I can see, and uh, as you already mentioned, um, industry needs uh, more, uh, more skilled people. Uh, for let, let's take for as an example uh, data science. 
So in case if you want to cover the, uh, that need, uh, you need somehow to increase uh, internal capacity, right? So, and you might have some educational uh, and tra training programs and stuff, so on. So uh, my question is, uh, how do you manage that? And what's the starting point of this process? I mean, uh, how do you come to the decision that you need to uh, meet some demand and uh, grow it internally? Well, 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 that's a very good question. So I'd like to claim that we see the demand coming and we preemptively start to hire and train uh, ready for it. The reality is often the demand appears and you think, oh, right, okay, you know, and then you start running to, ke to, to, to keep up. Um, the hiring at Data Art is an incredibly slick machine, so we do hire very quickly. The issue for us, of course, is that we have very high standards. So the vast majority of developers would not pass our code test. And so though we move very quickly to hire people, and we are growing incredibly fast, we always worry that we're growing too fast. You know, doubling the revenues of the finance practice last year was fantastic. We're all very proud of that. But if we doubled every year, you know, two years down the line, we'd all drop, fall down. And we just wouldn't be able to hire the quality of people. But we do have a great hiring machine. So we do actually respond to demand sometimes rather than preempting it. Now, but you can see things coming. Um, when clients start asking you the same question, what do you know about blockchain two years ago or three years ago? Then you think, mm, that's funny, that's six times I've been asked that in the last month. Maybe we should look into it. Actually, maybe we should actually get some skills. Maybe we should do some training and maybe we should hire someone. Sometimes we get to anticipate it. Sometimes we just find ourselves caught in a bit of a wave and we just have to uh, go mad. Uh, internally training, <coughs> um, we encourage anyone to, to learn new technologies. Anybody wants to take some of their time and just dedicate it. We have a, me we have a method, it's all, it's all you know, automated, where somebody can just say, I'm not going to dedicate 20% of my time to investigating blockchain or big data or AI, ML, whatever it is. And generally, we'll say yes. Um, because, you know, I, I think I th on one of our slides, I probably didn't articulate it very well, but there's a box down here which said research and development. So we do, um, we do allow our, our, our guys uh, to um, invest a, 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 lot, a lot of their time into new stuff. And that's the other thing, you see. It doesn't rely on me as the head of practice to go, I know what's coming next. Actually, people can just say, I think I know what's coming next. The developer t can say it, a tester can say it, and, uh, and we'll let them investigate it. Also, what we found is uh, build it and they will come. So if you actually s get a whole lot of people in your company suddenly interested in new technology and you encourage them and invest in them and then you think, well, we've actually got all these people who know this stuff and you start to mention it to clients, then suddenly you know, it's kind of a virtuous circle, then you start to get business from it. Good evening, saving Cliff. Hi. And uh, getting back to clients and interesting or non-interesting projects. What if your forever partner comes in and say, that's very interesting blockchain, but can you please scan for us 10 millions of papers? Mm. Will you take this money? Will you go to, i uh, suggest to go to India, or you try to convert it into interesting projects? Well, I mean, uh, a, a, bit of, a, a bit of them all. Uh, I can give you some real life examples. So, so we do say no. Uh, but and and, and uh, but we I always explain why no, I never just say no. I say and this is why we prefer not to do those sorts of projects. And and sometimes I just say we're actually not very good at them. Um, also, I I will say our staff are not interested in them, and we'll start to ask to get moved to other projects. Um, oh, I, my examples, <coughs> not quite the same thing because they're not boring, but. Twice in a month last year, we had new clients turning up. I think they were both new clients, yes. Turned up and said, um, we need a new CRM. Actually, one said, we need a CRM. One said, we need a new CRM. And both cases, I said, no, you don't. And they went, oh, uh, yeah, we do. And I went, no, you don't. What you want to do is you want to use customer data for your benefit and the benefit of your customers. That's what you actually want to do. Now, why don't we look at what that issue, find out what you actually want to do with customer data and for whom, and then we'll worry about how you do it because you may or may not need a CRM. Now, and they went, oh yeah, I, I understand that. So we did a sh you know, short sort of discovery investigation, had a look at it. One of them, we found they didn't need a CRM because actually they had their function, the functionality they required 
embedded in existing systems. They had a lot of packages and they hadn't switched on a whole bunch of stuff. So we switched on. You think, well, Cliff, you just said goodbye to money. But not really, because then they said, well, you're such great guys. C can you look at this, 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 and this? The other one, we looked at it, and yes, you do need a new CRM. So they said, great, can you build it for us? And I said, no. <coughs> Salesforce.com, why would anyone build a CRM in 2016? Doesn't make any sense at all. And they went, oh, right, okay. And then we showed it to them, and then we said, we'll do the integrations for you. And then they said, can you do some other stuff? And it all worked out good. We, 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 we always put the, we, we, I run courses on ethical consulting. We always put the needs of the customer first. Um, <coughs> bits of paper, bits of paper processing. One of the best firms in the world, they're not a partner of ours, I don't get paid to say this, is eClerks in India. So if somebody just says, I need manual parsing of information, I go, if, you know, if, it, if, if, if it's kind of general financial services, I go eClerks. If it's kind of specialist bond markets and fixed income markets, I say um, fact entry in India. I, I, I will tell them who to go to. And I will make the introduction as well, because I know all these guys. Um, uh, but we won't do it. We, we won't do everything for money. No. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Ah, status love. I saved my question. Actually, it partially uh, touches the previous question, um, and it's uh, you know like you said before, small and beautiful. Yeah. So my question is, uh, do we refuse clients, and why? I mean, like, what is the criteria to refuse a client? Um, well, I mean, if it's not in their best interest to use us, or it's something that our staff wouldn't like to do, uh, and and you know, and if, and if it's something where we're not expert, uh, or there's someone better than us, we, we you know. It's not a case of, well, you know, I, I try, I, in terms of refusing clients, it's usually a case of saying, we'd love to be your IT partner, but actually, for that particular thing you're asking about, there's a better solution than us. And, and you know, it, it does turn out that we end up as their IT partner anyway. Um, so, yeah, yes, we do, but we do it in a way where hopefully we at least remain friends and actually maybe we end up doing business anyway. Does that and the second part of my question wa uh, is that maybe there are some criteria of uh, financial aspect of the client, uh, particularly. Oh, I see, their credit worthiness. Um, well, if we look at a client and we think that, well, you've got to remember, we do quite a lot of startups. So though, I mean, though we do do some big organizations, I have to say Data Arts Niche is probably in the mid-sized organizations. That's why we're very good in invest and asset managers, investment management firms, private equity. Those mid-sized firms, ratings agency, market data companies, their cultures are actually a better match for data art than some of the big organizations in the world that are hugely bureaucratic. We also do quite a few fintech startups. Now, people come to us and say, well, we're a small fintech startup and you're probably not interested in us. And I go, no, no, we, we, we'll, we'll help. We, we probably don't make a profit, to be perfectly honest, but some of them turn out to be, to be amazing. And if their position is quite parlous, so they may or may not get investment and all that sort of stuff, then you know, we'll work out a deal. Um, sometimes we ask clients to pay us in advance on credit and all that sort of stuff, and, and you know, they'll understand. Um, so we don't, you know, we, don't take, uh, too many we don't take too many financial risks. If you look at the end of the year as to how much we have to write off, it's tiny. It's never going to be zero. But you know, we'd rather not say to someone, no, go away, you're not credit worthy. I mean, that's not very nice. What we would say is, Here's your credit worthiness. Here's your financial status. Um, can you pay us in advance? And uh, we go from there. We try and be nice guys. Thanks. Any question? Suggestion? <laughs> Recommendation? <laughs> Does everyone want to eat the biscuits now? Great. Let's applause once again. Thank you.